We are back on What the Funk. I've got Kirk Coburn checking in from Houston, where I'm guessing the weather is substantially different than it is here in Colorado, where I'm in my basement today because my kids are off of school due to about a foot of snow outside. Guessing you don't have a foot of snow in Houston today, Kirk? It's spring break weather, man. I mean, you can wear a bikini, and um, I'm sure you wear a thong to the beach, but... uh... Generally. For me, board shorts. It's board short weather. Although, if you recall, it was only three short years ago that spring break was a little bit different down in Houston. You guys did get snow. Things were <clears throat> crazy down there. And it's kind of cool, you know? I mean, I feel sorry for all the spring breakers, but uh, yeah, it's good. It's, it's, uh, it's actually relatively warm as, as normal, you know, this year. Yeah. We're, we don't have the February craziness that went right into March, uh, as like a few years ago. Yeah, that was, that was something else. People didn't know what to do. Your houses are designed to keep in cold. Our houses are designed to keep in heat. So we're ready yeah. for snow. You guys aren't, but many of but, us have nat- natural gas generators so that when the power goes out, we can still survive and heat. I think most of us have agreed in Houston, I think in order to live here, You'd rather die in a heat wave than than freeze to death. I think that's fair. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I generally don't think about if I have to make a choice between those two things, but but I'll have to get back to you on what my preference would be. Probably, I think freezing to death though is like you 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 freeze, but then when hypothermia hits, you feel like you want to go to sleep and then you warm up. So I'm like, maybe it's the better of the two. I mean, I'm not going to try it out firsthand for you to let you know, but um, <laughs> if I ever talk to anybody who dies of hypothermia, then I'll tell you. Um, you only got and Yeah. <laughs> so, Kirk, really, uh, really happy to have you on. You hit my radar because you started showing up on the Digital Wildcatters BDE podcast and um, made me laugh a few times. Seems like you're tight with Chuck and the gang. So... Wanted to have you on and have you tell your story a little bit to my audience, which even though it's all digital wildcatters, we have completely different listeners. And uh, I think you've got a good story to tell. So the question I ask all my guests, and I'll just ask you is, who are you, man? Who's Kurt Coburn? I'm ordinary on many levels. That's me. Um, and I'm just going to own that term. Um, I'm a dude that I have never been motivated I'm motivated by curiosity, I think, in many ways. And um, and I just follow sort of rabbit trails. And the current rabbit trail I'm on is I love the outdoors. That's always been a rabbit trail. I just love outside. So I surf. I play golf. Nice. And um, I don't do run. I used to ultra run. Um, I did 100-mile races. I used to do well, – Leadville was my sort of like in oh, the summer. That. Let's go. Let's go run 100 miles in the mountains. Crazy. I don't do that anymore because it's just crazy and takes a lot of time. And then on the career front, I've started multiple companies and and I made a really bad decision in 2010 to get into energy and I'm regretting it. And I'm 14 years in and I am still kicking myself, but man, it just sort of it sort of draws me in and I can't get out of it. So I'm an energy um, focused on a new business, but we'll talk about that at some point. But yeah, that's me, man. I'm from Where's Houston. You, I'm, you grew up. You grew up in H Town. Grew up in H Town. Went to University of Texas, um, and then uh, stayed in Austin um, <clears throat> until basically stayed in Austin. I lived in Nashville for a little while. Lived in Washington D.C. for a little while, but but definitely Austin was my home base till 2010. I moved back home, and I love. I mean, I just love Houston as a. It's a great place. To live. I'm going to stop on that one because I have a lot of negatives about Houston. It sucks outside. I'm just going to say it. I don't care what anyone else says. I'm a seven generation Texan. Wow. We got land grants from General Santa Ana himself. So we were here before anyone else was here. But Houston sucks, man. The bayou stinks, which I love the bayou. I swam in it as a kid. Wow. I love Galveston. It's my, it, it's, it's my beach. I grew up there. It's the best beach in the world to grow up on because every beach I go to is insanely awesome. So if you start at the bottom, you can only go up. <laughs> but it's my beach. It's my armpit. So like, I'm a big fan of Galveston. I love it. I love Houston, but it's not like the prettiest place in the world. 
it's it's very flat. It's very hot. The food is amazing. I really like the people. It's great. I mean, you can't you can't avoid Houston if you're in energy or oil and gas. I never went there until I was in oil and gas. My first trip there was about 16 years ago, and I went in February, and the for NAEP, and the weather was perfect. People were nice. I had amazing meals. I'm like, this place is awesome. Like I could move here. And then the second time I went down was in like July of that year. I'm like, how does anybody fucking do this? How do you do it? I mean, just I escape. I leave, I leave in the summer. I get out of get, get out of Houston in the summer, so I'm not here because it's too it's just miserable. Where do you go? The whaling capital of the world called Nantucket. Love it. It's great. Oh, nice. All right. Well, I'm a New England guy. I've never been to Nantucket. I've spent a good amount of time on Cape Cod and uh, Cape Cod and Martha's Vineyard. So Nantucket is on the bucket list. That's that's fun. You've got to go, man. It's great. You'll love it. Good yeah. surf, great golf, just great people watching. Yeah, summers out there are amazing. Winters, on the other hand, not so much. That's when you want to be where you're at. Brutal. Right yeah. I mean, that's, you know, the shining type stuff. Exactly. So talk to me a little bit about um, your career. So you went to UT, horns up, right? I don't want a 15-yard penalty. I don't want to get on your bad side. So I'm just going to say horns up right here. But also, like, so what did you do? You you hold down because that's just everyone admitting, like, we have the best hand, hand signal. And everyone's jealous. Let's just be honest. I've always liked it. I, I've been to that stadium before. I've been to a game. I like Austin personally. It's sort of like I live here in Colorado, and my business trips to Texas are 80% Houston, 18% Dallas. And that 2% that I get to Austin is Austin. Sense. Yeah, and I appreciate it. Not bad. No, it's not. So you graduate from UT. You mentioned Nashville. What did you do right out of school? What was your early career like? I um, I worked for Michael Dell. I mean, of course, a lot of us wow. did. Um, I had buddies working there. I moved. I was in Washington D.C. I thought I was going to take a different route, and I just didn't want to be in D.C. And I I went back to Austin, and my buddies were working at Dell. They're like, "Hey, man, this is a great place. This is right after the laptops." caught on fire. And so Dell was sort of on this, like maybe dying company. And then I joined and all of a sudden there's no, maybe there's no, you know, correlation here, but the company just rocketed up. And I was there during, (laughs) during that rocket. So I could have been responsible for none of it, but I was there. I didn't get fired. I loved every minute of it. It was awesome. And I did a lot of stuff there, but I was a problem solver. I, I was able to fix problems. And so executives would send me into different roles to fix shit. And I was good at it. And, and the threat was, if you don't fix it, we're, we're just going to fire you because we're not sure. You're not that work, you're not that valuable. But if you can fix this problem, we'll keep you. And so that's what I th- ended up doing for a while. That's neat. That's neat. So you really saw like... The early tech wave, right? We're talking about kind of first tech boom, at least what I would consider first tech boom, probably well, mid mid to late nineties at that point. And just saw this. Yeah, we launched right Dell.com, right? Dell. which became like the number one, you know, um co- e commerce site on the internet. The the internet launched. And I had a great idea. I had two great ideas while at Dell, and neither one really made it. But my best idea and I almost got fired for this one was we were, we were making a Palm pilot like competitor. Okay. And I was like, no, no, no. And at this point I was doing notebook strategy or something. I can't remember where, what role I was in, but I was in, I was close to the product side. I was like, what if we put a Palm pilot and a cell phone together in the Ooh. one? And they were like, that is the, who wants who wants a Palm Pilot and cell phone together? I was like, I do. I think it's a great idea. They're like, this is the dumbest idea we've ever heard. Do not bring that. We're not going to bring it up to Michael because you'll get fired. I was like. <laughs> was it that cutthroat? It was not sure. It was pretty. I mean, it's cutthroat. It's not the right word. It's like, it's all meritocracy only. Like you perform or you're out. And I like for some of us, you know, that's. That's what we liked. We liked that super competitive um, yeah. and and cutthroat. Not not cutthroat, just super competitive and meritocracy based. 
I loved it. And it was awesome. So you had the idea for sort of what, what ultimately became something like, like an iPhone. I say I did. Yeah. Yeah. Which that brings me back to it, to a story too. It's my podcast. It's all about me. Everybody knows that, but, but absolutely. It's what the fuck, dude. You know, it. late 2007, I had a Blackberry. I was super proud of my Blackberry. My Blackberry shit. It was so ripping, man. So cool. Blackberries. I loved it. I spent back then 150 bucks on it. Anyways, the Blackberry starts to die and I can't, you know, I can hear people, but I can't talk. There's something broken with it. So I went to the AT&T store and I, my full intention was to get another Blackberry. And there was a Blackberry on sale for call it 299 bucks, the most recent version. I'm like, okay, cool. I'll take that. And then I paused for a second, looked to the left and I saw the first iPhone. I go, Hey, what's this? They're like, yeah, that's that new Apple like iPhone thing. You can play with it if you want. I started messing around with it, and the price for that was three ninety nine. So it was a hundred dollar difference. I'm like, so you're you're telling me that this phone is only a hundred dollars more than this piece of crap right next to it? And they're like, yeah, that's right. I'm like, this company's in trouble. I'm taking the iPhone. So got the iPhone one. I, I remember being on flights, and people would be like, can I can I touch it? Like it was a novelty yeah, back then, right? That first iPhone. But it was game changing. And so, I, I mean, obviously I was hooked from the start, but, you know, I was just like, man, I probably should have bought some stock. Probably should have shorted Blackberry and bought some Apple, but I was a 20 something year old kid. I didn't know anything. Dude, I was there at Dell when Michael actually challenged Apple to return cash to their shareholders because we were going to put them out of business. And then Steve Jobs gets back in and becomes like, you know, one hit after another. And who knew that? Because everyone was back then, everyone was trying to figure out what's the future of mobile. And everyone thought it was audio video. Mm -hmm. Everyone did. It's like bandwidth's going to go through the roof. And Steve Jobs comes in and goes, no, I got it. We're just going to repurpose content that's already existing and repackage it and sell it. And no one understood that. The app store. I mean, who who would have known? I mean, it was crazy. It was brilliant. No one knew. Brilliant. No one knew. And like, great, I, I feel like idea. too, great idea. <clears throat> and the early idea too was like, that I liked. I'm like, oh, I can just listen to music on this too. So now I don't need to buy an iPod. Like, okay, so I just saved money because of that. I could justify the purchase of the phone because now I don't need to buy an iPod. Um, brilliant. You know, it, just, just really cool stuff. But anyway, so so you you go to Dell, you really cut your teeth, right? And and not like cut through up, but a meritocracy based tech company that that was really on the rise at the time may or may not correlate to your um, spending time at that company. But I'm willing to give you credit. And th- then what? Where'd you go from there? Did you stay in tech? Did you do something different? Like what was next? Did, did I tell you I was ordinary? So I thought I knew everything. I was so smart back then. And so I went, I left in 99 to, to go make a billion dollars in the internet. You know, Mm -hmm. this is back in the internet, big days. I go to this company in Nashville, I get fired in less than a year. (laughs) And I'm like, man, that didn't work. Well, yeah, I do. And, and it was a publicly traded company in music industry that basically a bunch of internet guys, including myself, basically destroyed this publicly traded company Mm. because of the internet. Internet implodes. I go to another startup in Austin. We raise like 60 million to do. This is great. Great idea. 2000, 2000 day. It was in 2000 or 2001. We did home security systems over broadband cable because this was back when every, all these cable companies um, installed all this broadband, spent billions of dollars putting all this yeah. infrastructure in. And people are like, well, what are you doing with it? And everyone's yeah, like, do I do? don't know. Yeah. But we were trying to justify, we were like, what about home security? And I was the product lead. And so we did audio and video in the home. Mm-hmm. And guess what? Like we we had to fight the like, oh, will people be creeped out because there's cameras? It was back when people were like, this is so weird. And we had Comcast as a big investor, mm. and we 
did two markets and we installed in, in Austin and installed in Las Vegas of all places. I spent a lot of time in Vegas, which is not great as a, <laughs> you know, kind of a young guy. Yeah. And it failed miserably. And then, you know, Ring is like, Ring comes out years later, once infrastructure, people started getting comfortable with having cameras everywhere. But this is back in the days when it's like, so anyway, we failed miserably, but I got fired from that company too. Um, and then Dell hired me back, which wow. was a, a blessing. It, it was funny. And just like, I, I got fired and I had a job then a week later. So it was like, I never really had to suffer and think about my decisions because I still was holding on to, it wasn't my fault. I never looked in the mirror. I was like, it wasn't my fault. They, and both companies failed. So I was like, see, I was right. Yeah. But, but then I, I, I got my MBA at night at UT while I was at Dell. And I was in a, another role where I was a fixer. I was actually managing NVIDIA and ATI and graphics memory, which is really interesting time in the ecosystem because, well, that's, that's not interesting. But what's interesting is that a really cool role. I loved it. Um, and then I was getting my MBA at night and I was like, man, I want to start a business. And so I wrote a business plan mm -hmm. for golf on satellite radio. I was like, this is a great idea. I'm a golfer. I was like, I thought, you know, and I wanted to listen to the masters while I was driving to work every day. And I sure. had this old FJ 60. It's an old land cruiser that was Chinese red. It kind of looks orangish. It was really cool, but it was a slow, it's the slowest SUV on the planet. And I drove from like what far West Austin to round rock every day. And it was like during the masters it was like, there's no one on satellite radio. There's there's it's cable for radio and there's no golf. I'm like, come on. So I wrote a business plan for it and it took off and we, it's still on the it's still on XM Sirius XM. It's called the PJ Tour Radio. Or nice during 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 uh, major golf events, it, it, it'll be called Masters Radio or U.S. Open Radio. But I started that and a few other channels on XM. Hmm. Ran the company, loved it. We sold it about four years later to XM, and they fired one guy. Me, of course, of course. <laughs> The guy who gets fired. Um, and they fired me because they didn't need me. But, it, but I also was, you know, a, from a, as an investor, it was great. As a, as, a, as a guy that was my job, I was sad. And so um, anyway, it worked. And I uh, realized then, not when I got fired, but I hired a couple people like me that were know-it-alls. And I wanted to fire one of them because he bothered the crap out of me. But I kept him on because it reminded me of myself and how <laughs> arrogant and foolish I was back in my previous startups where I got fired. So I, I, uh, I held on to him for just to remind me. So um, that's sort of where my entrepreneurial career took off. And it was the best job I probably ever had. It was super fun. But, um, you know, learning how to broadcast golf. For those of you that don't, care for golf yeah it's probably you'd probably rather go to an insurance seminar but for golf fans they love it on the radio it actually is the medium of the mind and it actually works live coverage is crazy but it does i, I buy that a little bit i mean for me i i like listening to baseball on the radio it's a bit of a rite yeah. of passage in in new england right you listen to uh when i was growing up joe castiglione and jerry Trupiano on weei and I probably listened to more Red Sox games on the radio in the summer than I actually watched on TV. And there's something just relaxing about it. And baseball is like a similar pace to golf. I'm not as big into golf yeah. as baseball, but I could see where people like that. It kind of like brings down your blood pressure a little bit. You can put yourself there. You can, you can do other things. You can do other things while you're listening, especially those in the car. And people commute, like commute times were going up and, you know, blah, blah, yeah. blah. So. You have an audience that's that's sort of you know perfect for that medium. So uh, I like this. So so now we're talking like what mid mid two thousands this yeah, point. Yeah, mid two thousands. That's right. You, 
you had a successful exit. You came up with the business plan. You executed on it. You found your passion. You love golf. You incorporated sports. And we started about. another company at, at the same time. XM was like, how do we promote XM and get more subscribers? Sure. And I was like, well, I have a great idea. Why don't we go to PJ Tour events and promote XM and we'll hand out these radios. They can listen to what's happening while they're following. Because you can, when you're at a big event, golf tournament, you can only follow like one group. Right. But you want to know what's happening. You hear roars, you don't know what's happening. So we started a company that was a basically, a we call it fan enhancement program, but we were a marketing agency that would go to major sporting events. We went to, we ended up landing NBA, NFL, Major League Baseball. We did all these different events for XM. And XM was like, remember, mm -hmm. there was like, well, why are you like, how, what do you guys know about marketing agency? I was like, nothing, but what do we know about broadcasting golf on the radio? Nothing. So they yeah. gave us the business and me and two other partners, they were younger um, and they flew around all to all these places. And then we started landing clients. Like we landed, um, uh, man, who's uh, now I'm blanking on his name. I love him as an artist. Who's the new Orleans rapper. That's, uh, um, uh, I Lil almost Wayne? said little Lil Kiki. Wayne? That's a Houston guy, but Lil Wayne, we did stuff yeah. for Lil Wayne and stuff. I don't know, but none of us were real marketing agency people. And there's professional agencies that do this type of stuff. And we would beat yeah. them in these, We'd win these accounts and we're like, but we have this business. We're like, we don't really care for this business. It's hard because we're flying people all over the country for events. And man, young girls in college that fly and do these types of events, glorified booth babes, they are selling subscriptions, but like, that's the worst business in the world because <laughs> they, they're never on time. They miss their flights and professional athletes always want to go out with these types of people for one night only. And they're right. thinking I'm going to land one of these people as a husband or, and um, they never did. So from a business perspective, it was a terrible business model, but we did that for a while and that was kind of fun. And then we sort of just lost interest because we had to go pitch new accounts. Like, and I'm like, we don't know what we're doing. It was hilarious. We're like, we're the successful agency that had no business being in it, but it was fun. It was fun. So, so I did that. So, okay. All right. So you had two businesses at once, which is crazy enough as it is. Yeah, it's terrible. Then, Don't do it. Uh, I'm I not Elon doing. Musk either. Ordinary. <laughs> like he's there's extraordinary, and then you've got ordinary. And I'm on that scale. I'm like, dude, that's too much. And then we I started a company. I got real into sort of like the entrepreneur organization and all these different groups. I was like, man, there's something missing. And I got real fascinated around marketing strategy. And I started researching and just studying it. And I started a company called Chief Outsiders. And it is basically outsourcing chief marketing officers for mid-market on a fractional basis. Mm -hmm. So companies that are trying, like basically companies between 10 to 100 million are struggling because they hit this innovator's dilemma. But the reality is they need to scale, but they don't know how because what... Right what they did to prove that there's a business doesn't work when you're scaling. It just doesn't. So they hire us to go in as their sort of interim or fractional CMO and, and chief outsiders is all over the United States today. It's doing really well, but hmm. um, yeah, we, we, um, I launched that business with a partner and uh, I landed a few critical customers in the early beginning and it worked. And I realized like, I'm just a terrible CMO. Like I'm a terrible number two. The idea is awesome. Yeah. And I was like, I just, am, I'm terrible at actually doing the work. I, I created all the content and here's how you do an engagement. Here's the model. Here are the first clients. But when I actually went into a client, I was like, this is what you find out when you go into these companies almost 99% of the problem is the CEO or the founders that are, uh, that are not willing to hire people better than themselves in the roles. Yeah. So they have usually sub talent that they don't have process and they're 
knocking up against the wall. And so you walk in, you have the CEO that's like wanting you to fix stuff and you have a team of people that hate you because they're really the issue. And I was like, man, I, I don't, I don't know what to tell you. So it, I was probably too immature at the time to really appreciate like good consultants are good at, at getting paid. And it doesn't matter if the company's successful, but for me as a founder, I'm like, if, if they're not listening, like yeah. that's frustrating, but good consultants are really good at being like, Hey man. Yeah. Hey, you pay me great engagement. Maybe you'll hire me again in the future and give me leads. Um, you know, we're out. But for me, I took it personally when companies are like, Hey, great advice, but no, we're going to continue to do what we've always done. It you was know, crazy. What was the point? Yeah. I, I would probably, I did it. feel that way. Yeah. I would, I would lean toward probably being a kindred spirit with you in, in that regard. Like, if you're going to work with us, I actually want to make an impact. It's not just about making money. You do. It, it has to be. It, it has to be meaningful, and it has to have. It has to have lasting impact. So your idea was really good. I would say, chief outsiders, you may have just been early. Like this is a huge thing now. I run a fractional sales company. There's all kinds of fractional. No, chief outsiders is all over the country. They're they're my partner is still like blowing and going. It's great. Yeah. Now's the I, time. I, it works. It's a great idea. And now I'd be like, man, it'd be perfect now. But back then I was not in a set where that's what I wanted to do. I I was like, oh, this is great. It works. You know, y'all yep. y'all keep going. Then I moved to Houston yep. to be like, I'm going to start an accelerator. That's what I'm good at. Like I love early stage. And so I started Surge, which was – me and a, a, a community of great people like, you know, Blair and uh, Mercury Fund and Houston Angel Network guys. And it was a great idea. Mm -hmm. And um, and Y Combinator and Techstars, Techstars just started to consult. I don't know what the balloons are for, but they're cons they no consulted idea. to help no to help other accelerators yeah. get off the ground. So we became a Techstars partner and we launched in 2011 and we did four classes invested in 45 companies all over the world and mainly energy software and so um we we're just too early i mean energy just didn't perform as an investor like you're and and yeah. it's funny my current company moak partners chip davis is like the guy when it comes to investing in energy software and he's got the best track record I met Chip during this time and he was brilliant, but our companies, and it's something I learned, it's taken me years to learn, but something I talk about and we talk about at Moak is your process is your product. Yeah. When you think about products and I'm a product guy, cause that's, I started, you know, even working for Michael back in the early days is I was a brand manager for one of our, product lines and I became product minded. Like it's all about the product. But when I think about products and especially energy buyers, yep. when they're buying software, is the software ever the greatest thing since sliced bread? The answer is almost never. Why does one company outperform another? It has almost nothing to do with the product. And what I mean is on a baseline level, you need a product that has a value proposition. And I'll, I have a definition that's probably unique okay. to others. But let's say that you have a product that works. But what separates you, let's talk about field ticketing because it's been on my mind and we've talked about. There's 30 companies that do field ticketing. yeah, And I've invested in two of them. And Chip Davis and Dave Levitt, my partners at MOAC, work for Liquid Fr Frameworks, one of the other field ticketing companies. Well, Liquid Frameworks killed everybody. They did. And I'm like, their product wasn't as good as, I know at least one of my companies, but they had a process to sell complexity into these big comp companies. Totally. And so their process was why they had great exits and they made a lot of money. And I'm like, that's something that's super interesting. And so Surge didn't, we didn't work to the level we wanted because we didn't have exits big enough to justify 
continuing to raise a fund every year. And yeah. it was, and almost every accelerator, there's only a few accelerators that actually make it. Techstars went sort of the corporate route and they raised some big funds. And Y Combinator is sitting in Silicon Valley and they get in on all the best deals that do exit. Yeah. But other than those two, very few other accelerators model really can work. But anyway, we I realized that in 2015, I decided not to raise another fund. I sort of shut it down. Surge is still around in terms of our four funds are still in, in existence, but we're not doing anything anymore. And at that point, I joined Shell Ventures as one of their managing directors. And that was super fun because I got to travel the world and... um that's great. Someone paid me to travel the world and invest in the cool companies. That was, I mean, what's, what's more fun than that? It's the dream, man. It's the dream. <laughs> it was. The so dream. going back to surge, right? So, so this is fascinating. Yeah. I, mean, I do remember hearing about surge at, at that point in time, you know, I've, I've been in oil and gas tech for 16 years. So, you know, you probably even took a look at some of the companies that I was at at the time, whether it was energy navigator or seven lakes or, or various others. But what, like, how big was your investment into these companies? And, and was the ethos like, we're going to invest in 45 companies and like two or three are going to hit it huge? Or like, we really think every one of these companies can give some level of return? No, we did 10 to 12 companies per class. We invested $30,000 for 6% equity. That was the model. That was sort of okay. the Techstars model. We derivated on the fourth class a little bit. We've tried to go a little bit later stage companies, less equity, et cetera. But the reality, that was the model. And the idea is we had the network. Yep. We had everybody involved. Um, the challenge is, you know, why is Exxon going to hire a startup? Like you can't even, it doesn't even make sense. It's like we're too big. We can, you can't handle us. And, yep. and, and founders, there's been this big myth that I am frustrated. Silicon Valley has done a huge disservice. And I think part of it is founders read too much Y Combinator shit, or they, they just think like they have all these flawed ideas. And one of them is just because you're a SaaS company, B2B means you're in the cloud, your pl your product is in the cloud, whatever. Sure. You're not on prem anymore. Your sales model is still enterprise sales. You're still right. selling a very complex product. And you're not really selling a product. You're selling change management. Yeah. And so Silicon Valley taught a lot of these guys like, hey, you just build it and they'll come. It's like, no, they're not going to come. Right. That's right. And Especially not, in oil and gas. They're not coming. They're not going to buy you. And then second, you need a sophisticated process to sell to them. And what's interesting is you know, a lot of our companies would be like, oh, we'll have prime buys. We'll do no monthly contracts, like nothing. I'm like, no, no, no. If you close a client, they want long-term contracts. Not you. The client wants long-term contracts because they want you to be in business to okay. support them and make sure because they're changing how they do business for you. That's right. Because you've taught, you've convinced them that there's a better way of doing things and they need you to commit to long term. So the, it's almost like startups can't work with these big companies because they don't have the process to be successful. Yet killing that whale, right? Reeling in that big fish is the dream of every Dude, one of these absolutely. tech companies. Absolutely. Like that's, that's what they live for, right? And, and the salesperson's thinking, man, I'm going to get a huge commission on this. They don't think about what this could do for future business. They think it's only going to be a boon. What if it fails? That could wreck your company. And oftentimes Absolutely. it does. Absolutely. So, so you dig deep into oil and gas tech. And I, I took a look at your, your site, even some names I recognize there. I remember Grease Book. Maybe they're still around. Yeah. It. There's, there's they some, are. You know, mobile tech, right, for lease operators. Makes a lot of sense. Like I was, I was kind of early in that game too. It just made so much sense. But the hard part that you mentioned is you're selling change management, right? You're getting people away you from are. a solution that they tie their value to the company and their job security to, even if it's archaic technology. And that's the hardest yeah. thing to sell to me. It's complex. 
and you're dealing, you're, you're, it's a complex sale and it's most people. That's why like, there's very few great salespeople in energy yeah. per se. And that's another flawed thing. It's uh, these startups. It, here's what's interesting. You're a sales guy. So let me ask, you know this, but it's yeah. so interesting. I was an investor for Shell, but I'm also a founder. So I've, I've been in, and I've spent a lot of chief outsiders. I learned a lot about marketing, the funnel, the entire funnel. I became an expert at it. Yep. But here's what's interesting. Most investors are finance people, have zero sales background. <laughs> yep. Most founders, CEOs that I talk to are usually they're engineers or they're product Techn people. They're they have zero... Yeah enterprise sales background. 100%. So what happens when I talk to both of them about, well, we're not selling. I'm, I'm, we're talking to this one potential company, well-known in the space. A lot of, they're generating revenue. that They've raised a lot of money. Their sales are just not, they're not performing. Sure. Because they haven't been able to convert into a complex sale. They don't have a process that's complex. And, both board and CEO is like, it's just a people problem. I'm like, it's not a people problem. It's a, pro you don't have a process that people don't know how to buy from you. And when your order, like when your order taking stops, cause the early adopters are like, Oh, that's cool. Now you need to sell these long-term deals and it's complex. You don't know how to do it, but yeah. founders and a lot of investors have, they just think sales is this, Hire a salesperson. I don't. It's it's as engineering and process intensive as writing code, and these people don't. They don't know it. So what they don't know, they don't understand, and so they just think it's just hire somebody, but it never works. You, you tell mean, me. I, you know, you're not preaching to the choir. I know this. You're, you're you preaching. This. I, I do this and I'm like, I go right to the belly of the beast because a lot of my clients are earlier stage and they're uh, founder led. And a lot of those founders, most of them are technical. They're engineers. Yeah. Somebody told them what they have is a good idea and they sold it a couple of times. And now the challenge is, well, how do I sell this to the masses? <laughs> right. And, and I always have to try to explain to these clients or potential clients, and they don't like to hear this, that you don't have a process. This is part of your problem. And, and the, the harshest reality for them is, listen, man, like you feel like whatever you created is the greatest bread slicer of all time. Nobody cares about that, right? They want to know the value that this is going to create for them and that you're going to be there to support them and the massive amount of change management that will take place for them to adopt your solution. And they hate hearing that. And sometimes it even keeps me from getting deals. But it's just simply the reality of it. I don't think people care, at least in oil and gas, how great the product is. They'll buy from people, they'll buy from security, and they'll buy from value. Can you bring me value? Great. What does the product do? I don't really care. Yes. You know, it reminds me, I was thinking back to the PJ Tour radio days, and we had the best content. So we, I had to, in order for get this deal with XM, we had to convince them that we had the great content. They could market professional golf, which those things were home runs, but that's not why they wanted to do the deal. The most important thing to XM at the time and still is, is selling advertising. Yeah. Because they were the fast, at the time, they were the fastest technology to go from zero to a million subscribers at the time. So it was like, they set the record, like super fast adoption. But what set their valuation was going from, which cable had to learn, was going from subscriptions to also making money on advertising. Well, I brought in advertisers and, and almost doubled the revenue by the anchors I brought on. But it was the advertisers on why they pulled the trigger. It was sales. It was the most viable part of the business. It was like, yeah, the content's really cool. Y'all prove you can do it. So product check, like anything else. Marketing check, yeah. Okay, we can get eyeballs, but it's the, oh, y'all bring revenue? Like, boom, we'll take that. Yeah, yeah. Revenue, man. It's like, that's what matters to these companies. These startups yeah, yeah. need revenue and they, 
They don't know it. They get easy wins and no one sells like a founder, but the founders, the founders are selling the dream and they don't understand why they can't hire people to just do what they do, but they're not successful because they don't have a process. They're like, well, sell like I do. Well, no acquirer or investor wants to hear that your selling method is going in the back door because that runs out. You run out of like that runway is too short. There's, there's so much here that's reminding me of why I started my business and even some of the early pitches, which I'm guessing is some of what Moak pitches as well. You and I talked about this when you were sitting next to Fred Funk, unrelated, but at your uh, golf club there in Houston, we talked about, so, so what happens, right? A, a founder-led technology company goes out and raises money and the investors tell them, all you need to do is hire sales guys, and then you're going to go sell the shit out of this product. So what do they do? They hire CRO, VP of sales, account executives, customer success, and lead gen people. And now your cost of sale, right? Cost of goods sold is extremely high. You're burning 100K a month on a sales team, and then you end up firing everybody. And you say, yes. like you said earlier, it's a people problem, so let's turn this over. So... I go into these companies and it's the best for me when they've hired a salesperson or team and it's failed. But I'll generally come in and say, so this is what's going to happen, right? Your investors are going to say, you've got the best product ever. Like now you need to hit these revenue milestones, go hire people. And I'm going to tell you what you need is revenue and what you need is to get in the room with decision makers. And that's what I'm going to do for you. And guess what? I'm going to charge you like a fraction of what you're going to pay. And you know what? If it doesn't work with us, then just do the traditional route. Your investors are going to want you to do that anyway. But I promise you, for these next six months, it's not going to work if you do it the traditional way. And I've seen it a million times. And you sort of want to be like, dude, you know this doesn't work. It's like, yeah, but the investors want me to do it. And this is the only way. I just put a number to each salesperson and they're going to hit their number and we're going to go to the moon. It never happens. It never happens. Ever. Tell me more about Moic. Yeah, Moic is a consulting firm. There's, there's myself. There's Chip Davis, who is with Houston Ventures. He's the guru in, in, in investing. And then Dave Levitt. Dave Levitt is a guy a lot of people know. He started his career at Siebel, and then he went to SAP, and he's part of the SAP Mafia selling. The reason oil and gas companies, the big ones that are using SAP, is I think Dave Levitt. He's the guy. He then he went to Salesforce and built Salesforce energy practice from zero to hundred million. And then nice. Chip plucked, got Dave to finally listen, take one of his calls and took him into Liquid Frameworks. When Liquid Frameworks was at a point where they had to fire all their customers and really kind of start over. Hmm. And they and Dave, as the head of sales, they built that company and had a great exit, and then they had a second exit, and then they had a third exit. So I remember that. Um, so the three of us really are focused on energy, B2B SaaS companies, on building a sales engine. So what is your process that can predict revenue and be transparent so that everyone in the company can know exactly where we are anytime? And so mm-hmm. we really help them on the sales engine. And we have a a process that's been proven that Dave has used throughout his career and p- other people that he has trained are using at their companies um, that is really behavior based and not on the sa- not on the salesperson, but on the, on the prospect is you can't move to the next stage in the process until there's a behavior that's been shown by the prospect. Nice. And then the second uh, service we offer is valuations is, when an acquirer is looking to buy you, yeah. how are you going to sell for the maximum price? And there's, we have both sort of key lever. We have five really important levers on the sales side that also apply to the valuation. And a lot of valuations based on, on your quality of earnings. So mm. when an acquirer is looking at you, they go into your sales and the mo- most important person usually in, a, in an audit is the chief revenue officer because hmm. they're looking for, are these contracts long? Are they with the right customers? Are they showing the right trend? Otherwise, I'm going to keep discounting what I'm going to pay for you. Sure. We also teach our clients how to take 
control over your exit process by managing your exit, managing the potential strategics you want to sell to and moving it from a short-term auction model to a long-term auction model. So that's what we do. And um, it's been awesome. We started in really this year and we're having a blast. I love the model and, and I think it makes a ton of sense. And obviously you guys have the right experience to, to execute on it. And I, f- I know you're talking to me, but I actually feel like you're talking to me because I'm just thinking about my own business as I go through this process of like, what is my business worth? Because like a lot of founders, I started a company because I had an idea and I didn't want to have a job. And then all of a sudden it turns into mm-hmm. like, hey, this thing actually produces revenue and now I have employees and this is sort of like a real thing. Like, is this business worth anything? Right. And then you're like, well, maybe I could sell it tomorrow, make a billion dollars. That's not going to happen. Right. So (laughs) I love it. You know, a question that I like to ask a lot of people, and I think that you're um, self reflective enough, is like, what advice would you have, one, to your Mm -hmm. younger self? Right. You in the 90s, hot shot coming out of school, getting fired right and left. That's one. And then two, what advice would you have for entrepreneurs that are trying to either build a company or exit a company? I think if I had to talk to myself is be patient. I think patience is worth a mm. lot. I'm not patient. And that's, there are times when I exit, like when I left Chief Outsiders, I knew it was the right decision, but um. I didn't feel good at what I was doing. Maybe that's a confidence thing. I don't know. Um, And it, it actually thrived after I left. So that's a good sign. When I start companies, if it's still in existence, you know, the PJ tour radio network is in existence, chief outsiders. I want to make sure like, is it still in existence after I'm gone? That's a good thing. I think. Yeah. Yeah. So to me is patience. Um, The second thing I think is, and this is hard. It's like, how do you learn how, you know, I'm unconsciously incompetent on a lot of things. And the, the big danger of being that is I don't know what I don't know. And when someone's telling me something, I, I don't know. And I don't know. It's hard for me to hear. Like, how do I, open my mind? One of the things chip reason why I like chip Davis and we're working together finally is he met with one of our startups at Surge and he literally went like 10 steps down this process hole with the entrepreneur saying like this, if you can solve this 10 steps later, that is amazing. And the entrepreneur Mm -hmm. was like, oh, whatever. I'm going to keep doing my little like mobile app that allows people to quickly build a form and that's all I care about. And of course, that company didn't make it. Is being aware that I know that I don't know. I at least want to be consciously incompetent. But moving from unconsciously incompetent to consciously incompetent, like that's, I don't know how to do it. But it's like being aware that I don't know. And that's important because I talk to a lot of CEOs and founders now, and they're so confident. Yeah, they're confident in areas that I'm like, wow, that's a big red flag. And they don't even know. And they're not aware to know when we ask questions that we sort of walked them through into a trap, not to be mean, but but just to ask, we're just playing devil's advocate and they walk right into the trap. It's like, man, how do I convince them that they're making a big mistake? And that's really hard. I love that. And I think to go back to the first one, patience is is extremely hard when you're young, especially when, and I did this, I don't anymore because comparison is the thief of joy. I would compare myself to my friends who are crushing it, right? Well, this guy's making Always. all this money or this guy just made partner at this big firm in New York or this guy's going to uh, you know, University of Chicago to get his MBA. I'm like, what the fuck am I doing? Right. Just putzing around out here, make $35,000. You start comparing yourself and, and nothing can happen fast enough. Right. Like I want to get there Never. And, and your path is going to be your path. Right. And just accepting that there are things that you don't know. Um, and that's okay. Right. Ignorance is bliss. I, I love that. I, I think you guys are well positioned. I think this industry needs a, a Moic partners, um, where can people like find you, find your company? What's the best way to get a hold of you if they want to learn some more? 
I mean, we have a shitty website and I'm trying to fix that, but we've made this decision to, we're not going to invest a lot in, in our image top of funnel marketing presence until we land some more clients. Okay. But Moa, you can find me on LinkedIn, Kirk Coburn and reach out. Um, Moakpartners.com is not necessarily working to the, to the degree I want, but Find me on LinkedIn because you can find everything there. And um, I'll uh, definitely reach out to you if you're interested. Love it. Kurt Cobain, ladies and gentlemen, makes me want to say Kurt Cobain. Rest in peace. Dude. But Kurt Cobain. Rip, man. Rip. And, uh, I, I'll never forget where I was, where it was what, Kurt Loader on MTV News. Dude, he he broke the news for you? He broke the news for me. I was in my basement, maybe like midnight on a Friday night, watching TV and just being devastated. And I was, I was trying to actually <laughs> to go down a different rat hole. Explain to my my oldest daughter who's thirteen, and she likes like rap music, so she's into like Boogie with the hoodie and Drake and some of these other guys who are hot. And I tried to explain to her how devastating it was my junior year of high school when Tupac was killed, and then nine six months later, Biggie was killed. It's like it, what that did to rap music, which I love for the next six, seven, ten years, maybe permanently, it changed it, right? Because you just lost like totally. some of the greatest ever. It'd be like um, Michael Jordan dying when he was like twenty-five, right? Yeah. Like then you don't. Have I watched COVID. a documentary on both Tupac and Biggie, and I've seen multiple documentaries. It did yeah, change. That That's we could talk for hours about that, but, but same thing with, with Nirvana, right? Like they were just like heading to the, they were so popular back then. Right. And, and that whole grunge scene in Seattle. Yeah. Soundgarden, right. Now, you know, Cornell passed away. I mean, there's, there's a lot, you know, from that era where there was pain and, and I think it set back music substantially. I don't know how we got on that rat hole, but I feel like it was uh, a That's a great cool, rat cool, hole. Cool. For another blog, another podcast, we have to go down that. Next time I come Get to Chuck Houston, as well. we'll do that. Yeah, I'm I mean, I'm sure Chuck would love it. He's buddies with Dave Grohl, right? Yeah, he knows everybody. He knows everyone. He's he's the man. Um, well, Kirk, really appreciate you coming on. I learned a lot from this session. I hope that founders and entrepreneurs, especially younger ones, took something from this. A lot of times you just have to see it yourself a few times. You have to fail. You failed. I've failed. You've succeeded. I'm still trying to succeed. Let's make the I'm best of what failing, we can. Dude. Let's not do yeah. that. <laughs> no more of that. I appreciate you very much, Kirk. Thanks for coming on.